Narcissists are all about winning, which is why divorcing a narcissist can feel impossible. On this episode of Navigating Narcissism, I've invited top divorce attorney Demetria Graves to break down this unfortunate and unique art of war. Unlike Demetria, many attorneys don't understand the intricacies of dealing with narcissism in a divorce, like the fact that it's not uncommon for these proceedings to last longer than the marriages themselves. In this eye-opening conversation, she reveals her pre-divorce checklist, debunks divorce myths, and warns of common mistakes. This is a must-listen for anyone divorcing a narcissist, thinking of divorcing a narcissist, or even thinking about getting married, period. After all, the best way to learn how to make it work is from an attorney who spent her career handling the pitfalls and the landscape of narcissistic marriage and divorce. If you don't want to go through a grueling experience of getting out, pay attention to how you come in. This podcast should not be used as a substitute for medical or mental health advice. Individuals are advised to seek independent medical advice, counseling, and or therapy from a healthcare professional with respect to any medical condition, mental health issue, or health inquiry, including matters discussed on this podcast. The views and opinions expressed are solely those of the podcast author or individuals participating in the podcast and do not represent the opinions of Red Table Talk Productions, iHeartMedia, or their employees. So, Demetria, I am so happy to have you here. Thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule. And thank you for inviting me. Dimitri, the reason your coming on the show is so important and so compelling is that in my own practice, Mm. working with survivors of narcissistic abuse, the issue of divorce, as you can imagine, is, is one of the primary issues I'm dealing with. It's either people who are in unhealthy marriages and are thinking of dissolving the marriage, Mm. people who are just coming out and making a decision, do I, don't I? Mm -hmm. And then the people who are already in the divorce process. Right. You you practice in California. I do. And each state is, is different in terms of how they address family law. And so the guidance you're going to hear today is from an attorney who does practice in California. While some of this may generalize, it's absolutely critical that anyone listening to today's episode seeks out counsel in whatever region that you live in, state, province, nation, whatever. So, uh, Demetria, if you were to put together a pre-divorce checklist mm, mm-hmm. for someone who is about to commence a divorce from a narcissistic person, what are the things that you would recommend? So number one that I tell my clients, all gloves are off, meaning the narcissistic partner is going to do whatever they can, say whatever they want to win. So if they can use your mental health, they're going to do that. If they can disclose your intimate details of your relationship, they're going to do that. If they're can align with your children, they're going to do that. So it's nothing is going to be quote unquote fair and it's not going to be amicable. Mm -hmm. So you have to prepare for that, that all gloves are off. Anything you shared with your partner, you might hear it in court. So you have to be prepared that they're going to say whatever, do whatever because they want to win. Demetria, how do you prepare people for that? Because that's a lot. Like what you just said is not, that's not just some little thing off a to-do list. Right. That's actually almost changing a worldview. Right. How do you prepare your clients at that stage? It's really hard to do because I've had clients that are attorneys, that are therapists, that work in the court Mm -hmm. and had to deal with, oh my God, all of my personal information is out, Mm -hmm, right? mm -hmm. So we have to spend a lot of time understanding, okay, this is going to happen. How are you going to cope? Because unfortunately, I'm licensed as an attorney. I'm not licensed as a therapist or to help others kind of deal with mm -hmm. the emotional trappings Mm -hmm. of their divorce. Mm -hmm. So I always recommend, especially with narcissistic abusers, that you have someone, a coach, a therapist or someone that can help you through um, your divorce, especially during those times when you're reading the intimate details of your life Mm -hmm, and intimate mm -hmm. details that you thought would only be shared with your partner Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and it's being used against you. So so the first step of this pre-divorce checklist is like, be prepared that the gloves are coming off. The gloves are off. 
are, are off, not yep. even coming off. It's <laughs> not like off. this. They're off. Okay. <laughs> what would you say is are some of the other items on this pre-divorce checklist? Your finances. Mm. The narcissistic mm-hmm. divorce will cost three to four times than the average divorce. I've had clients that were married five years or less spend a hundred thousand dollars on a divorce and that, counting. That's $20,000 a year for the marriage. Right. You could have put that in an investment right. and gotten a better yield on that. Ay, right. Ay, ay. It is very expensive because the narcissistic partner wants to win. Yeah. So they're mm-hmm. going to file every motion. They're going to do all the things to win. So you can have a five-year marriage but spend six years in your divorce. I have so many other questions on that. So I'm going to keep going on your checklist and I'm going to go back and ask my questions. What else would you put on this checklist? You have to be careful if you're residing in the residence at the time of your divorce, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Because then a lot of narcissists know how to bait you Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to start Mm -hmm. making the case for the divorce. And in California, a restraining order is tied to who gets custody. So I've seen where a narcissistic partner will try to get... Um, the other partner to hit them or to have these verbal disputes with them to attempt to get a restraining order. Mm -hmm. Because if there's a restraining order, then the partner has to leave, not the the abuser. Oh, I see. So you're talking about situations where people are starting the divorce process, Mm -hmm. but they're still both occupying the marital residence. Right, which is not uncommon in California. No, it's not uncommon. (laughs) Because it costs a million dollars to live I can tell you as a psychologist Mm -hmm. where I have worked with couples where Mm -hmm. there's a narcissistic abuse situation and they don't both leave the residence. I think that the psychological harm is 10 times worse. Right. And a lot of people still believe, even though they've experienced the abuse, that there's no way they would do that to me. There's mm-hmm. no way mm-hmm. they would kick yeah. me out of the residence. And I'm here to tell you they do mm-hmm. and they will yeah. because mm-hmm. it's all about winning. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then I think it's very important in addition to having a therapist to have mm-hmm. s- a support system. Mm-hmm. Right. Everyone won't understand what you're going through. But again, mm-hmm. your attorney is only equipped to deal with with the business of your divorce. Mm -hmm, Despite mm -hmm. what we tell you, we are not equipped to deal with the emotional aspects of of what you're going through. And quite honestly, you don't want to pay us to deal with um, the (laughs) emotional side of this. I'm cheaper than you. I know that for a fact. (laughs) (laughs) That's just the practical check, the Mm -hmm. checklist, right? Mm -hmm. The legal part of this is you have to be prepared that narcissists, tend to hire narcissistic attorneys. Okay, talk more about that. They choose people that will harass you and your attorney, Mm -hmm. that write letters, emails, seven pages, ten pages, can be every day or every other day, extremely condescending, and make you feel like, oh, wow, did that happen? Or did I say that? Or is this really happening? And so that is something to prepare for. And if I had to learn myself how to disengage how to maneuver Mm -hmm. a narcissistic attorney. That was Mm -hmm. a new phenomenon for me, Mm -hmm. but it is very real and it is very dangerous. Okay, so I'm going to ask you a sort of a procedural question. Mm -hmm. Since they probably don't have all sit on one website, narcissistic attorneys for family law, like Mm -hmm. there's not one place you can find these people. Mm -hmm. How do they find them? Do they just interview them and say, oh, you Mm -hmm. seem like a jerk. I'm hiring you. Or is there a reputation? I think it's like it tracks like, right? Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, You tend Mm -hmm. to go to the people who you're most familiar Mm -hmm. with and who feels good to you. It feels good. You're right. So Mm -hmm. if you're narcissistic Mm -hmm. and you go to someone and and they say, I'm not doing that or I don't believe in that or Mm -hmm. no, we're not going to do that. You're not going to go with that person Mm -hmm. because Mm -hmm. you want to win and you want to control the show. So if if you can't do that, that you're not going to select that attorney. Okay, I got that. That let's say there's two people in a divorce, mm-hmm. and the narcissistic person picks up the phone and inquires about uh, retaining mm-hmm. five or six top divorce attorneys. Right. Are those people then now not allowed to write? Yeah, disqualified, yeah. Well, it depends on how much information is shared. If you just call and make an appointment, then no, you didn't share anything that was important to the mm-hmm. case. Mm-hmm. If you call and pay a retainer fee, mm-hmm to speak to the attorney and you speak for an hour on your case, then it's likely that that attorney can be disqualified. And if you pay a bigger retainer, yes, Mm -hmm. then the attorney will probably be disqualified. Is that a, is that a thing that ever happens that a person who actually is not going to retain X or Y attorney, but wants them not to be retainable as, as it were by the, let's call them the non-narcissistic partner, the other person. Have you seen that happen? Yes. Especially in, 
in small cities because, you know, you know who the quote unquote top attorneys are. Yeah. So if I disqualify all, let's say, 10 attorneys, you have to start going out to different places. I see. To people see. that are less experienced in those cities. And so that's so, a yes, thing. It, it is a thing. Okay. All right. Mm-hmm. Anything else on this checklist? Oh, yes, most definitely. Again, we talked about the costs. It's going to take probably double the time as well. There are uh, many cases. There's two I have right now. Both married less than five years, and their their divorces are set mm-hmm. to go beyond the time they were married. And so my clients get frustrated. Wow. And Demetria, can we just offer them X amount of dollars to go yeah. away? But you know, like I know, it's not about the money. It's right. about the control. Yes. It's about the mm-hmm. grandstanding mm-hmm. and court and wherever mm-hmm. else. So a lot of times they don't want the money. They want to keep trying to ruin financially and otherwise mm-hmm. the other party. It's about the game. Right. Right. I mean, that's that's really what it is. They'll game the system, mm-hmm. draw it out, expensive appeals, mm-hmm. delay on discovery, providing documents yep. and all of that. But then one day they find their new person that they want to marry ever right. oh so quickly. Right. They split up on paper they, and they push it. We got mm-hmm. to hurry up. We got to hurry up. We got to mm-hmm. hurry up. Aren't you the person who took like four <laughs> months to come up with four one years. four years, right? And so it's really what it is. It's like you said. It's they have to be in control yes. of the whole process. It's not necessarily that they draw it out. Sometimes they really try to rush it, right? With so quickly that the other person can't even get their feet under them because they want to quickly get. Usually, it's remarried. Right. In my experience, right. I mean that takes me to the idea of bifurcation. Yes. Right. Mm-hmm. And so, and bifurcation to me is always code for. The narcissistic person wants to get married. Right. Right. After they've made this other person's <laughs> right. life miserable for right. three years. Right. And then if you could just explain for our listeners what bifurcation is so they understand what that concept sure, is. Sure. That's yeah. just a fancy way of saying that we're going to get divorced on paper and we're going to handle the issues of our divorce later, meaning yeah. we're going to handle custody and visitation, division of assets and debts. We're going to save that for a later date. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that always works out really. <sighs> so when, when the bifurcation is done, and yes. signed. Yeah. Those people are then legally single. They, yes. they can go enter into the contract of marriage, marriage with, someone, with else. someone else. The marriage is done even mm-hmm. though all the other stuff's going on. That right? is correct. Yeah, because when I've seen that happen, it was a rush for them to get into their new, new, and, relationship. And new relationship, new mm-hmm. marriage, big white wedding, the right. whole nine yards, but this whole, and, and there's this whole big mess. It's like every, people are coming over for dinner and you throw all the stuff in the closet. Right. Like, you know the closet's <laughs> still a mess. <laughs> all right, so let's keep checklisting. Sure. What else do you have? Your attorney, you have to pick an attorney mm-hmm, that mm-hmm, is aware of what's mm-hmm. going on or is stern enough to stand up to the narcissistic attorney mm-hmm. because they will be condescending. They will drive you crazy. Right. And you have to learn how to draw the line because your client is kind of watching you as mm-hmm, well. Mm-hmm. So you want to be sure that you're not engaging in that. Yeah. That is something I had to learn because mm-hmm. it is so easy when you're mm-hmm. constantly attacked to want to attack back. Mm-hmm. But that's exactly what they want. How did you get good at this? Because I don't imagine that there's a law school class called How to Practice Family Law Against a Narcissistic Opposing Counsel. It was trial by fire because I found myself, you know, typing away my email. They would type an email. I would type an email. And I said, what am I doing? Mm -hmm, I'm costing mm -hmm. my client a lot of money. Mm -hmm. And this is exactly what they want you to do Mm -hmm. is get entrapped with with whatever their issues are. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But when I started saying, okay, thank you. I have your email. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. It stopped. Interesting. Was, Was there one case and you realized that you almost had to sort of take a very different tack going mm-hmm. forward because you learned so much about narcissism and narcissistic mm-hmm. abuse in one case. Yes, it was <laughs> a case that is still going, Ooh. but it was still every day. As you know, Ms. Graves, I'm called what we call a certified family law specialist. Mm-hmm. So she would always say, well, as a certified family law specialist, you should know X, Y, Z. So it was constant so jab, Passive aggressive. Very passive essence, aggressive. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I had to get to the point where I said, well, what is more important, fighting with this person yeah. or getting our client to the finish yeah. line? Mm-hmm. It is not easy. I will not sit here and tell you it is easy. It is not, especially with my personality. I want to fight back. But I had to be the bigger person, Mm -hmm. and it's um, better for my client, Mm -hmm. but it it is challenging. You're having to do what I tell clients to do with narcissists all the time, which is don't engage. Right. Right. That's it. Don't engage. Right. If people don't like that, they're like, this person right. is talking nonsense about me. Like I, yes. And I said, 
<laughs> I understand that. Mm -hmm. And in your case, it's even more interesting because of your fiduciary responsibility right. that you do have to protect your client financially. You're not just supposed to sort of run the meter, mm -hmm. you know, constantly because right. if you did answer all of those emails, it would be you a lot of money. Bleed them dry. Right. Yes. But not only that, our clients are watching us, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. if I'm getting upset and I'm getting mm -hmm. emotional, mm -hmm. then my mm -hmm. client's going to get upset mm -hmm. and emotional. Mm -hmm. So I, it's not easy and mm -hmm. a lot of times I spend time with my client because sometimes they want to know well why are we fighting back and yeah. should we be doing this and I have to have the conversation no mm -hmm. the more we engage the more it's going to cost and it's not getting us anywhere mm -hmm. what Demetria learned early in her career is a classic tactic that works with any narcissist in any scenario it's called gray rocking essentially acting like a boring gray rock when interacting you respond with brief, disengaged answers. In time, the narcissist realizes that you're not going to engage, and then they will back off. Mm -hmm. Did you know about narcissism before you became a family law attorney and before you started practicing independently? No. You did not? No. So this is where you learned it in right. doing it. A lot of times you're like, well, is this narcissism or is this person just controlling? So you do have to go and do your own research and you do right. have to go and start studying and, and learning. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. I think that's what a lot of other attorneys do that haven't had this experience yeah. and some judges right because we do use narcissism a lot now it's mm. more discussed than before yeah and if you don't enlighten yourself it, it, it's hard to really take serious and know the signs and know how mm -hmm. to engage in the process one thing i'd say to that though dimitri is that it's almost less important to get the narcissism part right mm -hmm. you're, you're not it's not it's not your job to be a personality assessment expert right <laughs> Right. But, you know, so it would be very rare mm -hmm. to have someone who was harmfully controlling, mm -hmm. but then it was also really empathic and nice. Right. Right. Like those right. things don't tend to co-locate. Right. That that very harmfully controlling person might also be coercive, is very likely to be unempathic, mm -hmm. is very likely to be entitled, right. you know, is very likely to be validation seeking and mm -hmm. on and on and on. Mm -hmm. So this stuff kind of hangs together. Right. And that hanging togetherness means it's I the one thing I've always had a concern about is whether attorneys or even family court judges are getting too lost in the weeds of well, is this a narcissist? I said, forget it. Let's write down the patterns that are concerning right. you. When they're done, if I were to look at the list, I'm like, right. probably. Right, right, right. You know, right. but but I think that it's it's gonna be very rare for there to be a friendly controlling person. <laughs> 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 right, right. 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 So I think that that's the other thing to almost lift that pressure mm -hmm. off of all attorneys right. to say you have to be able to make that call. But mm -hmm. what you're looking for is consistency. Right. Right. This is not just someone whose heart is broken mm -hmm. and on the first day is saying mm -hmm. like, darn you, you're not going to do this to mm -hmm. me. And then they're like. All right, she's not into me anymore. I just right. gotta, you know. All right, and you know what I'm saying? That there's there could be that m initial moment, right. Right. but that's not what we're talking about. No. We're talking about things that are going on for years and years and years. And again, it feels like that they've taken a system mm -hmm. and turned it into a game. Right. Keep giving me that checklist. Did we hit it all? Is there anything else you want to add to that? The children aspect. Ah, okay. That's that the, they, say, the biggest one. Right. Last. Attempt to align the children with their agenda, mm -hmm, and what mm -hmm. they tend to do is by toys, by mm -hmm. iPhones, mm -hmm. by PlayStations, mm -hmm. and cry. I've seen the crying act. Yeah, it's very manipulative. And how can mom do this to us? Mm -hmm. Mom is breaking Talking up. Talking about the collective. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, breaking up our family. Mm -hmm. We're going to have to move. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Mom's taking away your house. Mm -hmm. And children, that is very, very hard because children do not mm -hmm want to be in the middle. If you're buying them all these toys mm -hmm. and constantly mm -hmm. talking bad about the other parent, it's, it's very confusing. Do you then prepare them and say, this is going to be yes. really Yes. Everything difficult. I'm talking to you about, we sit do. and have these mm -hmm. conversations. Okay. And so the intake process with someone that is experiencing narcissistic mm -hmm. abuse is way longer than any other mm -hmm. process because it's way more factors to consider. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think it's important you have to look at the practical side of things and the mm -hmm. legal side of things because I'm not yeah. there with you mm -hmm. when, you, when you're right. at home yep, or yep, when you're yep. getting your finances together mm -hmm. and all these other things that are ex extremely important, mm -hmm. but also the legal aspects mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and making sure you hire the right attorney for mm -hmm. the si situation mm -hmm. that's going to deal with all of these mm -hmm. aspects. And then the last thing on my checklist is over litigation. 
the case mm-hmm. is going to be overly litigated. Mm-hmm. I have a case mm-hmm. right now. Mm-hmm. We're in court at least once a month. I get two to three different motions. A lot of times I don't even know what the motion is. And we're in front of the mm-hmm. court. And what's shifting in this particular case, I think the court is on to the narcissistic partner. Oh, okay. And so when that happens, and uh-huh. we know things start to shift. And yeah. it, But uh, it took us three years to get there. And what happens in family court also, judges change a lot. Yeah. So a judge can be on to the narcissistic partner, but then they leave. And so we're starting all over. Ah, and and it, listen, uh, my what I've been told by clients, mm-hmm. and not just in California, is that it was luck. Like if you got the judge who understood narcissism, yep. there was going to be a much more reasoned judgment. But if you got a judge who didn't get narcissism, the judgment almost felt sadistic. Right. Even though it might have literally followed the family law code, it followed mm-hmm. it to the T, right. there was absolutely no recognition of the game that was being played in their courtroom. The overly litigated pieces from my psychologist chair mm-hmm. in these narcissistic divorces is it's not just the the cost, it's not just the headache, it's actually the trauma. Yes. Because I find that my clients will say, I'm having nightmares, mm-hmm. I can't sit still, mm-hmm. I am constantly ruminating, mm-hmm. I am not in my life, my body yes. is falling apart, The they say, I'm afraid to look at my inbox. Yes. And mm-hmm. so those sorts of things, the phone pings, they jump. Yes. The phone rings, they jump. The email is, is mm-hmm. and to the point where some folks were saying, I was not being good about checking my email, yes. running into some issues at work, mm-hmm. because it was that stressful. Right. And it's not just about the over litigation as like, now I have to show up to court again. Right. It's a 24-7 issue it is. that does tremendous harm to people who are going through these divorce processes. You have this checklist. It's great. I would say the biggest takeaway from mm-hmm. your list to me is mm-hmm. you have to ch- you have to shift your expectations. Yes. Right? Yes. And so that's that's a big one. Yes. And you know, you bring your you keep coming to this point because it seems like what a person needs is a really informed guide through this process. I have often told any Mm -hmm. client who comes to me Mm -hmm. going through a narcissistic divorce, I said, you have to retain an attorney. You are not doing this online. This is not going to be simple. How do you recommend that a person choose an attorney Mm -hmm. if they're going through a narcissistic divorce? I think it's important to have your own checklist for your attorney. Mm-hmm. Have you have you mm-hmm. worked mm-hmm. with any cases that mm-hmm. had a narcissistic mm-hmm. person on any side? Mm-hmm. Um, what is your approach to mm-hmm. the dissolution? Mm-hmm. And if they're over talking you or not addressing the issues, they probably do not have the experience. Or if they say things like, oh, I don't know about if I don't believe in narcissism and that sort of thing. That's it. it is not the attorney for you or if it's someone that's a little more passive you know a little more kumbaya it's not going to work it's not going to work for you boom that's it and then you do have to follow your intuition Mm -hmm, a mm -hmm. lot of times we have a bad habit of not listening to our intuition Mm -hmm. especially in situations like Mm -hmm, that i think mm -hmm. that's just as important as the Mm -hmm, attorney mm -hmm. checklist i'm so glad you brought that up because i i cannot tell you demetria Mm -hmm. The number of people who, when they met, were meeting with attorneys, Mm -hmm. and they'd say, listen, my soon-to-be ex is narcissistic. I'm really worried about how this is going to unfold. They were told by the attorney, everybody says their ex is narcissistic. Yep. Which, to me, is actually a version of gaslighting the client. Yes. Right. Mm-hmm. It's completely minimizing their experience. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's dangerous because what that does to that client is saying, Oh, I guess you're right. Everyone going through right. divorce thinks that person was just rotten and that's why right. they're leaving. And so maybe none of this is even, you know, right. ma- maybe that's the wrong word. And you're right. They could get into that wrong attorney. And mm-hmm. I'm so glad you as an attorney are saying this. If they are not listening to what you're saying, right. I've heard this <laughs> dozens and dozens of times. Right. The worst, hardest cases are the folks who come to me who are already four to six months into the divorce mm, process. Yeah. They're shredded and they're stuck with this attorney. Right. And a lot of times, I almost say people can get trauma bonded to their divorce attorneys. Yep. Just they were trauma bonded in that relationship. They're working really hard. Mm-hmm. They are trying for me. We're this far down the path, justify, 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 which is what happened in the relationship. Right. And I'll say, this person is acting in your service. Right. And I understand you don't want to throw more money at this problem with mm-hmm. a new attorney, mm-hmm. but this could end up going really badly. And what are the biggest mistakes people make when they come in, they start the process of a narcissistic divorce that you've seen? They engage 
from the from the mm-hmm. get go. They're in the mm-hmm. house. They're fighting. They're mm-hmm. fighting in front of the children. Mm-hmm. They engage from the start, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and that really sets them behind the eight ball because mm-hmm. the narcissistic abuser is already planning what they're going to do in divorce. Mm-hmm. They're probably recording you. They probably have you on camera doing things that you're not supposed to do. Mm-hmm. That's the the number one thing mm-hmm. I oh, see. I, oh, oh, <laughs> I'm not I have work with clients. Yeah. I mean, it just becomes the war of the cameras right. and the recording devices. Yep. And I understand it. Like from the position mm-hmm. of the non-narcissistic person, they've said sometimes these cameras have been a game changer mm-hmm. because I've actually taken the footage and showed it to my attorney and said, right. this is what we're dealing with. But on mm-hmm. the same breath, I have had to tell mm-hmm. non-narcissistic folks going through divorce, you're, you might need to hire someone to sweep this house. Right. Probably 50% of the time they found something. I'm sure they have. The other mistake I've seen is in not having a plan. These types of cases require a plan. Mm-hmm. How are we going to address this case? Are we going to allow the other person to file first? Which I say yes, because mm-hmm. it gives them the illusion that they're in control and they get to set the stage. Mm -hmm. So you need a plan for these cases. It's not Mm -hmm. like the typical divorce where, okay, you file, I file, Mm -hmm. we go about our happy way. You need a plan. Mm -hmm. Okay, so basically the mistake is coming in without a plan, continuing to engage, and then having the wrong attorney. Mm -hmm. I would love to share with you what I have seen, what I thought were mistakes, but I'm not an attorney. Okay. Okay. And I'd love to hear what your take is on some of these. Some of the mistakes I've seen is people having a very unrealistic view of what's going to happen in the family court system. The biggest being, well, people are going to see that I'm a really devoted parent and they're sort of terrible and mean. And if I show them all the mean emails, Mm -hmm. well, they're not going to give them any custody. Right. Wrong. (laughs) 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 <laughs> so wrong. Right. Right. I remember working once years ago with a family and this was like one of those really happy families mm-hmm. too. Like everyone's loving each other and getting along and the mm-hmm. parents have been married like a million years and everyone mm-hmm. was happy. Daughter's going through a narcissistic divorce mm-hmm. and the family's like, well, they're going to see he's terrible and he, he's had affairs and mm-hmm. he screams at the children. They're going to give you all the custody of the kids and we're going to help you and we're going to move next door to you. And mm-hmm. they had it all figured out. Right. <laughs> until the process began. Right. And he started fighting for 50% custody. Right. Would you know, of course he got it mm-hmm. because yelling at your wife for having an affair are mm-hmm. not in most states, the grounds, nope. not, certainly not in California, right. to not have custody. This family was shattered. Mm-hmm. They said, we had no idea. So they mm-hmm. literally didn't know how the system worked. Right. And is that, would you say that that's a mistake? I think that's not having a adequate conversation with your lawyer because your lawyer should tell you in California there is a really big push to have 50-50 yes, custody there is. and then on top of that with a, not, a lot of attorneys and a lot of judges not being aware of narcissism they're not looking into it that mm-hmm, way mm-hmm. they're saying how far do you live from each other yeah. are the kids okay 50-50 mm-hmm. custody mm-hmm. right so there has to be very detailed conversations about the topics that are most important to you mm-hmm. so you do know what to expect mm-hmm. and no. then you have mm-hmm. to stay clear of attorneys that lie to you mm-hmm. if they mm-hmm. tell you we're going to give you everything you want you yeah. want 100% custody you got it <laughs> run because <laughs> okay. that's not realistic so glad you said that too yeah. which is that idea that an attorney may promise you the moon and stars. Oh, right. this case, I'm easily going to get you 80%. No problem. I have heard people say that. Mm-hmm. And, and it was none of it was true. And what right. then? Well, Tell your attorney should be telling you the pros and cons of your case, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. You don't want, you should not want to hear all the good things. You should not want to hear, mm-hmm. I'm going to win mm-hmm. the moon and the stars. Mm-hmm. You want mm-hmm. someone that tells you these are the pros of your case. Yep. These are the mm-hmm. cons. This is where I think mm-hmm. we're going to have problems. Mm-hmm. Yep. 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 And, but it, it is a, it is such an emotional time that I also think what's challenging is people can't really hear what's being said. Right. That's a big one too. Honestly, when they're coming in your office, you know, there's this whooshing sound in their ears mm-hmm. and they're probably hearing about half of what you're saying. So things in writing and all of that would make a huge, right. huge difference. Well, that brings me back to my original point that we are here to help you with the business mm-hmm, of your mm-hmm. divorce. So the more you can have support outside of what we mm-hmm. do, the better you can yeah. potentially hear what mm-hmm. we're saying. So let's talk about mediation, okay? Because this mm. is one that comes up all the time. Mediation is put out there as a what's considered maybe a more civil and less costly approach. Is mediation ever a realistic option for people who are going through a divorce with a narcissistic person? I think it's only an 
a choice when they have new supply. Supply, or narcissistic supply, is the validation that the narcissistic person wants and needs. This can be praise, attention, a sense of power, control, and domination, like they might feel if they are commandeering a divorce. When narcissistic people have enough supply, we see the charm, charisma, swagger, and arrogance. These relationships are notoriously one-sided, with the narcissist needing supply and the rest of us giving it. So if they're trying to get out of the relationship fast and they really want out and they're ready to give you what you want because they're focused on something else, then it might work. Otherwise, it doesn't because Mm -hmm. it's in direct contradiction to who a narcissistic person Mm. is, right? Because they know everything. Mm -hmm. So if you know everything, you can't hear the mediator. You can't hear what they're trying to tell you. You can't hear them. And they want to win. And mediation is not about winning. It's about compromising. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. so if they haven't moved on and and they're still kind of focused Mm -hmm. on this process, it's probably not a great idea. I I found your example really interesting, Demetria. If your narcissistic person has already found new supply, Mm -hmm. you know, that they found a new person to validate, invariably Mm -hmm. in a divorce is that they've met someone new. Right. Which, again, narcissistic people, they're, again, because they don't go Mm -hmm. deep with anyone, they're able to replace you with someone new and and very quickly if Mm -hmm. they didn't already while you were still married, (laughs) right? So (laughs) they have their new supply. Mm -hmm. That's fascinating to me is that you found that in some of those cases, the Mm -hmm. person's found their new supply, they're feeling in a rush to get engaged and to get married, Mm -hmm. that that might be a point if that narcissistic person, though, is sort of feeling such a pressure that they just want to get you gone and mediation could potentially But you better hope they don't break up with the supply because then (laughs) the focus is back on you and we're right back to where we started. So now we get to this interesting place of the language people use. Mm -hmm. Words like narcissism and gaslighting. Again, I've been told this by my clients who will say, when you say these words in the courtroom, you're sometimes viewed as the problem. Yes. Can you talk to us? Okay. Can you talk to us about that? Yes, because I think it's so, I don't want to say overly used in our society, but Mm -hmm. I think it's it's a new concept. We're learning more about it. Mm -hmm. And some people don't want to be bothered. Mm -hmm. And so most judges have 20 to 30 cases on their Mm -hmm. calendar. And so if you you go off script and start talking about things that they're not familiar Mm -hmm. with, then you, of course, are the crazy one. And maybe we should look at you Mm. or maybe you're the narcissist Mm -hmm, because you mm -hmm. keep bringing it up. Mm -hmm. Courts don't want to hear it. So you have to be very careful with the language you use. Do you coach clients who are going through narcissistic divorces on that saying, we're not, I get that you're your mm-hmm. ex is, or soon to be ex, is a narcissist. But yes. I get that they're gaslighting. I get all that. We're not saying these words. Do you prepare them to find different ways to talk about this stuff yes. in front of a judge? Talk about the issue at hand. Mm-hmm. This person did not do the exchange at this time. Mm-hmm. I am concerned because of X, Y, Z. Uh, Demetria, I want to understand when a person has, you have a client, mm-hmm. they have a narcissistic ex who has a narcissistic attorney, are there any legal guardrails in place to stop this process from becoming full-on ongoing harassment? Yes and no, mm-hmm. right? So there are codes in the family code that can sanction a party for over-litigating. There's even codes now to sanction the attorney, mm-hmm. but doesn't happen in practice? Not really. Interesting. Okay. All there right. might be a slap on the wrist, a warning here, mm-hmm. um, but not anything significant. So what I, that means what I'm hearing is that it is conceivable. Some this, this entire process can be commandeered by someone if they have the attorney who's willing to do it for them to turn into a place of harassment for years. I've had a case for almost five years. They filed over 90 motions. 90. To what end? Like those, the, how different can each of these motions... Wh- so we're my client and I are just like here we go. Wow. What ends it? Is there a point mm-hmm. where a person who holds some form of mm-hmm. authority through the state or the courts or the mm-hmm. county or whatever can finally say clocks time's up? Mm-hmm. We've run out. Right. Is that a thing? Well, we eventually get to a trial. Uh-huh. 
and that would eventually end it. But we have to get to the trial. Oh, so the trial is sort of the punctuation mark right. at the end of the sentence. Right. But my understanding is it does take a long time it to get to trial. It does take a long time. Is that because all of this other stuff has to happen first, or is it because the courts are backed up, or both? It's both. Okay. But a lot of times we have to do discovery, and that's you know that's a way to extend the case. Oh, I didn't get this. Or, oh, I need to do another deposition. Oh, I need these documents. So if that... And for our listeners, I didn't want to interrupt you, but I just because we're using this word discovery, I right. know it, you know it. But my understanding of what discovery is is sort of the 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 providing all of the appropriate documentation of and anything that's needed to be able to get what's need, so that decisions can be made in the case. Am yes, I right about that? Is that? Right. So it mm-hmm. could be tax documents, it could be bank well, financial statements, bank statements, yes. deeds, anything, right. deeds. Uh, it even could be medical records related right. to children. And but that then takes when you're in this process, discovery is all your text messages to my client yeah. for the last five years. <laughs> All your text messages to your mother for the last five years. Wow. So it's another form of harassment. Yeah. Because it, it doesn't solve the case. Can there, is there ever an authority that says, no, you're not getting the text messages to the mother. That's not a thing. No. Like, no. 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 So they, people can open. just sort of ask mm-hmm. for anything that they want. Mm-hmm. and Because they can make up any reason why they need the messages to your mom. Wow. Right. You told your mom you were going to give her the house. Mm-hmm. So that mm-hmm. becomes a way to try to obtain text messages. I see. I see. What I tell clients mm-hmm. who especially when I get them in the beginning is I, I say to them, in about six months, you're going to start regretting that you filed for divorce. Mm-hmm. And you're going to think you've made the biggest mistake of your life. And mm-hmm. I want you to know that is coming. Mm-hmm. because of what this process is to the degree I can give them some psychoeducation that mm-hmm. they are going to ask for things that are you can't imagine this is going to become your second full-time job right. pulling all this documentation getting all the stuff together mm-hmm. y- you are going to feel traumatized I tell I like literally this is it this is what's mm-hmm. about to come mm-hmm. so the way we've been talking about things Dimitri we have definitely been talking about folks who have money what do you advise to a person who is about to approach a divorce? Mm-hmm. They do not have resources. Maybe they're renting an apartment, Mm -hmm. but it's the stuff with custody and, you know, child support, spousal, whatever. Um, How do you advise people in those situations where it may Mm -hmm. very well be contentious around things like custody, but they simply don't have financial resources? The beauty of L.A. County, at least, is Mm -hmm. there are a lot of self-help centers Mm -hmm. that will assist with the documents. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of... Um, organizations mm-hmm. um, that will also give you mm-hmm. an attorney if mm-hmm. you meet their criteria. Mm-hmm. So you might have to do a little legwork and si- search out who can help you, where you can get the documentation. A lot of the court's website has all of the information mm-hmm. you need, and they try to do a really good job mm-hmm. of outlining mm-hmm. what you need to do step by step how to mm-hmm. file the documents. There are also pro bono attorneys mm-hmm. that take on some of these cases mm-hmm. free of charge. But we all know that that's not a lot because, you know, attorneys cost money. But most attorneys will provide a free consultation. Okay. So do not go into court without a, at least talking to mm-hmm. someone, mm-hmm. to at least mm-hmm. getting some of the tools. They might not give you everything, mm-hmm. but getting some understanding of what to expect in mm-hmm. court how it's going to happen, how you should present your evidence. At least try to have a conversation so you're not going in blind mm-hmm. and not knowing what to expect. Ask the attorney, hey, do you know this judge? What can I expect? What should I say? How should I dress? Should I address the other party? At least you have some framework of mm-hmm. what to expect, mm-hmm. even if you can't afford representation. Okay. So, However, it's got to be challenging in these cases. Oh, absolutely. What about other issues, like even around immigration status or anything like that, which could leave a person feeling like they're at peril? Right. How does that work? Immigration status is not presented in family court. Okay. It is not an issue that Mm -hmm. the court will consider. Mm -hmm. And courts actually get a little irritated Mm -hmm. when people try to bring that up because it's not part of the family law experience. Okay. Okay. That's good to know. And then most courts also have interpreters as well. Mm -hmm. So I would consider bringing your own Mm -hmm. if you think the court's going to be Mm short-staffed or if they don't have your particular Mm -hmm. translator. But most of the times they do have Mm -hmm. interpreters Mm -hmm. available at the court for the the court hearing. There are workarounds, but it's going to be harder. I mean, I think that there's no sugarcoating this. If a person is is Mm under-resourced, going through this experience, and 
again, they're so psychologically wrecked right. that working their way through, even through these low-cost resources just feels it's challenging. too overwhelming. It's really challenging. Yes. What about when you have one partner mm -hmm. who has very few resources, right. but the other partner is do, is more resourced, right? right. So they, they have a job. They make the money. They're financially controlling. They financially control all the money. What about those situations? That party can go in and ask that the narcissistic partner pay for their attorney fees. Now, that's going to probably come with a lot of... <laughs> I mean, they can you can ask for anything you want. A lot of challenges. <laughs> so, yeah. But that is the standard in family mm -hmm, law. If mm -hmm. one party has the ability to pay, mm -hmm. they will be on the hook for fees. They will. Okay. Now, will you actually get it is the question. Mm -hmm. The court can order it. Will you get it is an issue. Okay. I have also seen where the the non-abusing party loses their attorney because the narcissistic party is not paying the fees. And so a lot of times the non-abusing party is left defending themselves mm -hmm. because they can't afford or mm -hmm. the other side is not providing mm -hmm. the appropriate fees. Okay. So, and I've seen that happen too. So mm -hmm. I want, you're, you've raised something though that I don't, I want to ask about. Okay. Mm -hmm. I've seen this one happen over and over and over again, mm -hmm. which is this person, narcissistic person, making tons of money, right. bringing it in, living large. Now this process starts and oops, they, they, oops <laughs> lost my job. Yes. Okay. All right. Close my business. I That's close the big, my business right. is a big one. Right. Close my business, lost my job. Mm -hmm. So now this starts this entire game around support payments and all of mm -hmm. that. Can you talk a little bit about those scenarios in a narcissistic divorce? Well, thankfully, if they are employed, we can do wage garnishments and that mm -hmm, sort of mm -hmm. thing to make sure that, you know, support is paid. Mm -hmm. But it is a challenge if that person is self-employed. There's nothing to attach to. Mm -hmm. And so then the non-narcissistic party is trying to survive. Mm -hmm, so then mm -hmm. this process becomes less important because I don't have money. How am I going to take care of the children? Mm -hmm. How am I going to live? Mm -hmm, and so mm -hmm. now they're off their game while the mm -hmm. narcissistic partner is going on their game plan. This sort of sick and twisted sort of sense of pride of like, yes. look, I stuck it to this person. I, I, I won. I, I won. Mm -hmm. I, I, and I, and may still have resources and, and whatnot that mm -hmm. they can access because all they did was step away, like you said, from right. the self-employment right. kind of a setup. And that's why I always try to talk to, to clients throughout the process about the practicality of everything mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. of course I do this every day right so this is my yeah. job this is yeah. what I do but how are you going to live what is the plan yeah, if he yeah, takes yeah. everything mm -hmm. away what are we doing because mm -hmm. you're not going to want to do this process if you don't have anywhere to go at night yes so that's extremely yes. important to me yes, yes yes okay what does community property really mean community property really means that all the property and the debt for that matter that we accrue during the marriage belongs to the both of us. Okay. So if we buy property, regardless of whose name it's in, are assumed to be mm -hmm. community property. Mm -hmm. Okay. And cars. Cars. Furniture. Furniture. Everything. 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 And it doesn't matter if you bought it from your bank account or my bank account or your salary okay. or my salary. Okay, right. I'm going to ask you a funny, tricky, strange question. Okay. I just, I, so I've worked with more than a few people who are with narcissistic cheaters. Oh. Okay? And so the narcissistic cheater, he'd buy an expensive item, a watch, a piece of jewelry for the, for the, the, other, for the other person. Right. Okay? A special friend. That thing now uh, belongs to someone else. Mm -hmm. But presumably these joint assets right. were used to buy a $50,000 gift. Right. How does that play out in a divorce? It really depends on the station in life, right? Because mm -hmm. if 50000 is really like 500 it's probably not going to be a thing. A thing. Mm -hmm. But if 50000 is mm -hmm. twice your salary for the month or whatever it is, mm -hmm. it's going to be a thing. And you might have to give that back to the community. So, in other words, the, that the other gift person is gone, gone. Yeah. but that fifty thousand may have to come back in. It's a yes. really, it's a, it depends kind of scenario. I know yeah. of a circumstance where a person found a receipt for an important, for se yeah. expensive pieces that mm. equaled about fifty thousand. Mm -hmm. They weren't hers, right? And so then she knew that this was purchased for someone oh, else. Oh, that's and, definitely a divorce issue. Mm -hmm. Do you ever advise a person in a divorce with a narcissist where there's going to be all this toing and froing? That if they can find a number that works mm -hmm. for them, that would be less than the 50% that they're entitled to, might mm -hmm. even be 30%, but right. they can live with the number. Right. 
take it and go, even though it's not what the law might have awarded them. Uh, all the time. All the time. Interesting. What Can you talk this, more about that? Yes. What is it worth to you? What mm-hmm, is your mm-hmm. mental health worth to mm-hmm. you? What is your peace worth to you? Mm-hmm. What is your you know freedom worth mm-hmm. to you? And some people, sometimes I have to you know talk them back up. Some mm-hmm. people say, I don't want anything. Mm-hmm. I walk mm-hmm. away from all the houses, all the stuff. I just want to go. Let's talk about infidelity. Okay. Okay. Narcissistic infidelity. Mm-hmm. That Because the fact is, not all relationships where there's infidelity end up in divorce, frankly. Right. In fact, a lot don't. Don't. Mm-hmm. Narcissistic infidelity seems to have a little bit of a flair mm-hmm. to it. It's mm-hmm. either repeated. Yes. It's in your face. Mm-hmm. It, the person's gaslighted about it. Mm-hmm. Whatever it is. When you and and they've already, if you're married to a narcissistic person, they've already been abusing the heck out of you anyway, anyway so treating right. you terribly. And then there's this whole other thing happening. Mm-hmm. And so. In your experience, when infidelity is mm-hmm. a driver of that divorce, mm-hmm. do those divorces have a different feel to you from the perspective of you representing the non-narcissistic person? Right. They're very dramatic mm-hmm. from the start. Mm-hmm. But again, we're managing expectations. Because yeah. unfortunately, in California, we have a no-fault state. Mm-hmm. So infidelity is important to the person that it happened to, yeah. but it's not important in the context of the divorce. So I'm having to say, yes, let's talk about it. I want to hear about it because it's important to you. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, when we go into court, Mm -hmm. judge doesn't want to hear about it. That must be a big part, again, about the expectations. Right. And I think that's a shocker for people who think, like, isn't that, don't you get, like, points for that? (laughs) No, and then some people get mad at me because I'm honest, Mm -hmm. right? Everyone doesn't, you know, Mm -hmm. appreciate the honesty. I've had people Mm -hmm. not hire me, go hire someone that told them what they wanted to Mm -hmm. hear, and then come back Mm -hmm. because Mm -hmm. the honesty is important. Mm -hmm. I'm not Mm -hmm. going Mm -hmm. to tell you, Mm -hmm. yes, go tell the court Mm -hmm. all the times Mm -hmm. he cheated on you because the court Mm -hmm. just doesn't want to hear about it. Interesting. Have you ever represented the narcissist? Yes. Okay, talk about that. I think that was before I really understood Mm. what was going on. Mm -hmm. And when I was a lot younger Mm -hmm. in my career Mm -hmm. where the money meant something more to me than... Um, my reputation and they know how to control you. They know how to get out mm-hmm. of you what they want and the money is flowing. Mm-hmm. So in your career, before you learn all money is not good money and your reputation matters. And, you know, mm-hmm. you have constant money coming in and that's a very hard experience because you have no client control mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. they know more than you without a law degree. They know more than the judge. So it's very hard to maintain the case. Now, the next thing I want to go talk about Why do people get divorced? I could spend an hour on this topic, but I heard this quote before and it really stuck with me. I think people spend more time preparing for the wedding than they do the actual marriage. Mm -hmm. People Mm -hmm. aren't talking. They don't know what they want the marriage to look like. Mm -hmm. They don't know what makes them happy. They Mm -hmm. haven't talked to their spouse about what makes them happy. Mm -hmm. So people are just getting married and then trying to figure it Mm -hmm. out once they get In the relationship. Mm -hmm. I think what's also challenging, though, is that the narcissistic relationship, so add a whole level of of challenge to that, right? Yes. Because with all the conversations in the world, we're never going to make this relationship healthy. No. And then people say, well, shouldn't people have figured this out before they got married? Mm -hmm. Ish. You know, the idea of this whole trauma bonding, justifying, um, not quite getting what this is. Maybe I'm expecting too much from a person. Maybe I'm the one who's too sensitive. I mean, the whole litany of things we talk about on this podcast all the time that folks are kind of in a storm. Mm -hmm. And so then there is this idea of like, but I really do want to get married. I really do want a family. Right. If their friends are all getting married, there's this whole agenda that's happening that has nothing to do. And so they're thinking, oh, I saw some stuff that made me uncomfortable, but there was enough Mm-mm. boxes being ticked. I'm like, oh, if there ever there was a time <laughs> to not compromise, it's before right. you agree right. to this. Yeah. But even once they're in it, yeah. the justifying, all that stuff continues. And communication and all of that stuff, that's all off the table. Right. People are in a mess that they just simply don't understand. Right. And if they don't have the language of narcissism, right. they just don't even know what they're dealing right. with. And most of the time, they're blaming themselves. Right. I so. wish there was there were more procedures to get in. I oh. wish there were more conversation, yeah. more yeah. procedure to get in mm-hmm. and to mm-hmm. force people to really think about 
the I, commitment. I really agree. And you know what? I think part of the problem is a lot of that has happened in sort of more religious spaces. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Like, you know, marriage churches, counseling. marriage counseling, yeah. you know, these these six sessions you might have to. And I think that's tricky mm-hmm. because what I, I think that's designed to like, let's talk about things. But I actually mean sort of if, like, for example, when a patient comes to my practice, there's an informed consent. Right. Where I'm kind of listing everything that could kind of go wrong. Right. Nobody is signing informed consent for marriage. No. There is no form. No. They're not even talking about it. <sighs> That's a thing. Yeah. Informed consent for marriage. I never I like even it. thought about it until I now. Like, it. like, please know that. Can you imagine? <laughs> a lot of people, like, and there'd be two doors. If you right. still want to get married, that'd be that door. <laughs> and the other door, there's the bar over right. there. Right. And just have a come have a drink. I want the bar. I, I, think want, I the want the bar. bar. I'm like, I think I'm going to take a pass <laughs> on that one. Okay. So when you're in a narcissistic relationship and things go wrong, the one thing a narcissistic person cannot do is regulate disappointment. No. They cannot. A a job offset, uh, not getting the bonus they thought, not getting the promotion, not getting the money, Mm -hmm. whatever it it may be, Mm -hmm. things not working out the way they want, they lack the flexibility to roll with that. Right. And so... A marriage that was already a little precarious because this person was really difficult to start with when Mm. things go wrong, it all when it falls apart, it falls falls apart apart colossally. And narcissistic people always blame everybody else for what's gone wrong. This is your fault. This is your mother's fault. This is your sister's fault. This is the kid's fault. Mm. This is the dog's fault. And then when the divorce process starts, this is an unfair process. This is the entire process is stacked up against me. Mm -hmm. Victim, 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 victim. Right. And that's how they go that through that process. But a lot of narcissists hide too they can really hide who they are Mm -hmm. charm your Mm -hmm. socks off Mm -hmm. until you're married Mm -hmm. Demetria notes that narcissism can hide behind charm it's not that they hide it's that the superficial charm is a tactic meant to get validation and that is on when they feel in control and in power but lurking underneath at all times is the rage that comes out when they feel insecure So they can be very charming in a Mm -hmm. courtroom. Oh, yes. And what's challenging about this is if a person's gone through a narcissistic divorce, Mm -hmm. they often look crushed. Mm -hmm. Okay? They look crushed and broken by the process. So they can look hollowed out. They may be hunched over. They may be crying. Mm -hmm. They they may not actually even look well put together because they've been through something. Right. The narcissistic person comes in there. They're charming. They're nice grandiose. Yep. They've got their, they're, they're so privileged. They feel like they belong mm-hmm. there. They almost, they're yep. acting like they're buddies with the judge. Mm-hmm. That's what the judges need to be able to see through. Right. Because that picture is maybe of like, well, maybe this person just was like, there's something wrong with them, mm-hmm. the other person. Mm-hmm. And this person seems to have it really well sort of put together. Right. Have you ever had that situation where your client was really sort of, broken down by this Mm -hmm. process Mm -hmm. and then the charming narcissist comes in and waltzes into the courtroom and everyone's thinking well they've got it all together Mm -hmm. i have and i've had to have a hard conversation if we go in here crying it's Mm -hmm. not going to be good for us Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so let's cry now let's Mm -hmm, take a break mm -hmm. let's go have coffee and then we're going to go back in Mm -hmm. because unfortunately it is a sign of weakness Mm -hmm. and when we go into court again we want to present our facts our case and get to the court what we want Mm -hmm. but if we go over there like you said slouched over crying your message Mm -hmm. is overshadowed Mm -hmm. by that it's unfortunate because there's a reality to it the reason that person is hunched over is because they've gone through something it's not you know what Mm -hmm. i'm saying it's they're not at all weak in fact that's a really strong response right they're experiencing something real right but we the judges do not understand trauma right but this is what i tell my clients too again this is a business Mm -hmm. and there's a way you have to present your business Mm -hmm. we have to deal Mm -hmm. with our emotions and Mm -hmm. our trauma and everything we went through but unfortunately, we cannot present mm-hmm. that in the courtroom. So let's talk about you now of custody. It's messy enough already, mm-hmm. and this is where all the emotions come in because mm-hmm. most people will say car, dining table, mm-hmm. house, even whatever. Right. I want my kids. Right. Mm-hmm. How do you help people through this process when they're starting right. and going through a narcissistic divorce and this custody issue of minor children is in play? It depends on where we are in a Mm -hmm. case, Mm because I've had a case where the narcissistic partner went and tried to win custody before the case even started. Right. So when we're in that circumstance, and clearly that's a different strategy. Mm -hmm. And sometimes if you even start with 50-50, it kind of unravels on its own, Mm -hmm. because sometimes Mm -hmm. 
the narcissistic partner cannot sustain it, sure. especially if there's new supply that they're focused on. Mm-hmm. They don't even want their children 50% mm-hmm. of the time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, they don't, but they'll fight for 50% because right. they know they're going to mess with the other person. But now, then it falls back. apart mm-hmm. and they can't do it. So, And the fall apart process, because a decision, a court decision may be made for 50%, right? right? Mm-hmm. The fall apart would then be the documentation of this pickup didn't happen. They didn't right. take them for any of the weekends they were supposed to. They disappeared for but three weeks. But they don't weeks. care about that because they won. They won the 50-50. Right, but then your client now mm-hmm. is now going to have to mount up the legal argument and go back into back court. court. Yep. Right. So that's the thing Mm -hmm. is that to modify and that's not you're not going to get that appointment right away. And so while you're waiting, those gaps of time Mm -hmm. got the 50 50 judgment, Mm -hmm. narcissistic person messing up, messing up, messing up. Mm -hmm. New court dates all the way over here. Right. But in this entire process here, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. what's happening is that that narcissistic person, the Mm -hmm. narcissistic ex, Mm -hmm. narcissistic co-parent is lording it over them. Hey, I got 50%. Yep. Don't you plan a vacation? I got 50%. Yep. They don't mm-hmm. take the 50%, but the court date's all the way out right. here. Mm-hmm. This is so psychologically difficult for people oh, yes. who are holding up 80% custody. Right. They're not getting the financial support necessarily if right. they're entitled to it right. for 80% custody. Right. But then when they try to plan a life for these children, it's mm-hmm. exactly then where that narcissistic co-parent will say, well, I do have 50%. And right. if you don't do that, well, then you are in violation of, the court of that order. 50-50. Yeah. That's the game I've seen played over and over and over again. And what's sad to me are the kids are watching. Yes. They see what's happening. Yes. They're the most impacted. Right. This sticks with them. Mm -hmm. And a Mm -hmm. lot of children do not have the language to express how they're feeling Mm -hmm. and what Mm -hmm. that's like. I also think of the number of people who sort of wait until their children are either coming at 16, 17 years old Mm -hmm. or full on 18, like 18th birthday celebration of my 18th trial's 18th birthday is I'm rolling up to court and I'm filing for divorce Right, where the custody stuff is off the table. Right. The big question I get, why can't the courts just do what's right to protect children and instead get caught in this? Mm -hmm. Well, by the, by the law, they're allowed to have this. What are your thoughts on that? I think courts think they're doing the best that they can with the information Mm -hmm. that they have. Right. Mm -hmm. Because, we both know narcissists can hide some of this behavior. They can present the best of themselves. Mm -hmm. And let's say I'm going to use myself for an example. If I have a mental issue and I went to a mental health health facility for a couple of months, you're using that against me. Mm -hmm. So now it's how can she take care of a child if she has these mental health concerns? Or how can she Mm -hmm. take care of a child if she Mm -hmm. works 80 hours a week? Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. so they know how to use things against Mm -hmm. you to make themselves look better and mm-hmm. hide the narcissistic mm-hmm. traits. The thing that I try to work with clients on is, can we get you set up and your attorney set things out the right way that you make the narcissistic person snap? Mm. Yep. That's the game. I mean, right. I hate to say game, but, it, but it, that's it is. the game. Right. You know, is how can we get them? And part of it is, you know, you not reacting, you staying strong, you coming in looking like your fierce self right. and your new suit right. into the courtroom, right. that it's anything that can make them, again, snap so that their personality Comes will through. show to the to the right. judge. There are other players when there are ch- there are custody when there's children in yes. custody. Mm-hmm. There are people who represent the child mm-hmm. in in proceedings. Yes, these folks are a blessing and a curse because a lot of them don't understand narcissism. Right, and it also depends on who they align with. Some yes. align with the narcissist. I know that, and that can be very, very dangerous. Very dangerous. Can you explain what a guardian ad litem is from a legal perspective? Right, that's just someone that's appointed as the guardian of the child if something, for whatever reason, either parent is not in the capacity to care for their kid. Okay, and so the guardian ad litem is someone the parents choose, or it's somebody who's acting. Sometimes in their... the court has to choose uh-huh. if if the parents are unable to choose. Okay, so this is a person who's in the child's life. Yes. Okay. And, and, and sort of helping represent their interests in right. the court process. And what I see mostly in family court, at least here, is either minor's counsel, yes. which is a lawyer that is appointed for the, child. to, for the child's voice. Mm-hmm. We also have minor's interview, where mm-hmm. minors are interviewed mm-hmm. by the judge um, to talk about whatever the issue may mm-hmm. be. And then we have custody evaluations where someone that's like a therapist comes mm-hmm. and evaluates the mm-hmm. situation and makes a recommendation mm-hmm. for the court, um, what they deem to be the children's best interest. The bigger problem to me is sometimes they don't have enough time to yep, really get yep, into yep, the nitty gritty yep. of no, what's going on. And most people don't have money mm-hmm. to 
to pay for a private mm-hmm. evaluator, that can That's be it. fifteen to twenty thousand dollars. Exactly. That's exactly um, right. And then again, if that person aligns yes. with one of the parties, it, it's not giving the court mm-hmm. adequate mm-hmm. information. Yeah. And then minors counsel. It, most parties don't have money to pay mm-hmm. for the minor to have a lawyer. Mm-hmm. Yep. But I know for me in my practice, I, I, I don't like kids to have to be interviewed or have mm-hmm. lawyers. That is very traumatic. Is they very do traumatic. not want to do that. No, it's, very, it's very traumatic. And yeah. I, Okay. So this is another right. really important one. The kids are often, if, if not hurt, sometimes even traumatized by this mm-hmm. entire process. Yes. What if you have a situation where... One parent very much wants therapy for the children, mm-hmm. but the other parent is saying no, and you, they have set up their medical care is that both parents have joint, to sign joint, off on it. Joint legal custody, yes. which is what most parents tend to mm-hmm. have is mm-hmm. joint legal custody, mm-hmm. meaning they both can make legal decisions mm-hmm. about the child. But I will say family court is very, very um, supportive of therapy for children, mm-hmm. especially in divorce settings. Mm-hmm. So you better have a really good reason why you're objecting mm-hmm. to mm-hmm. therapy and mm-hmm. why you feel it's not in the best interest. Because mm-hmm. what can happen is you can lose your joint deciding authority and that one parent can have the the authority to decide if the kids are going to do therapy or not. If the one parent is trying to stop something yes. like There has to be care. a really good reason. Okay. okay. All right. Why, so the, Yes. Yeah. However, I have seen, though, that the, that the parent who is trying to refuse therapy could delay the, forestall the process oh, yes. because they're waiting for the hearing right. until they have that. So it could be months, sometimes even a year, right. the child can't get therapy because you can't get right. both parents to but sign what I've off heard, on it. But um, judges say in that regard is that is not child-focused. Mm-hmm, and if mm-hmm. you don't come up with a good reason, right. I need to know why the other parent yeah. shouldn't have okay. so legal custody. I think that the hardest thing that people learn is that family court is actually not designed to protect children. No. That's not its function, and that's what a lot of people think it is. Mm-hmm. And sadly, though, this system is harming children. I have worked with yes. adult survivors mm-hmm. of these of these court mm-hmm. systems. I'm thinking of one woman in particular, and she said, I was destroyed by what happened in that family yes. court. That 50-50 custody yes. damn near broke me. If the function of family court is not to protect children, mm-hmm. what is the function of family court? Well, they, they will tell you it is to protect the children and get the parties <laughs> divorced, but... As we're talking, that that's not the case. It's not the case. Yeah. So, but so, right now, the, it's pushing the cases through. Family court has so many cases in front of no, them, especially yeah. mm-hmm. post pandemic. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So they're not spending the time on each case to really get down to the details of what's going on. They can only do with what is presented to mm-hmm. them by the parties. Mm-hmm. And a lot of times you cannot have or we can't see the narcissistic behavior because they're hiding behind mm-hmm. their mask mm-hmm. and they do it mm-hmm. really well. Mm-hmm. To me, family court mm-hmm. is a place where this legal contract called marriage mm-hmm. is un- is taken apart. Yes. And I think that that contract part... Mm-hmm. I mean, it's it's that's not very romantic, and it's, <laughs> no, not, it's not sexy like a honeymoon yeah, or a wedding yeah. cake. Mm. But it is a contract. It is a contract. And when we take contracts apart, ahead of their term, mm-hmm. there's a process. Yes. And then what if the, the what if the narcissistic co-parent keeps trying to drag the other person back into court over everything, from mm. the hundred dollars for karate lessons to the new pair of snow boots, mm-hmm. like every little expenditure they're trying to adjudicate? How do you handle those cases for your clients? I have told my clients to keep as great as records as mm-hmm. possible. Okay. Document everything. Mm-hmm. I mm-hmm. paid you ten dollars on mm-hmm. February twenty third mm-hmm. for karate. Mm-hmm. Whatever it is to document mm-hmm. it because nine times out of ten, if the narcissistic partner did not win, mm-hmm. you are going back to court. Okay. What is your guidance around um, family communication apps like My Family Wizard Love them. and um, talking parents? Love them. Yeah. And I think our family wizard has the tone meter. So if you feel right, <laughs> if you feel right. that you know you, you might use choice words, it has a tone meter and it'll tell you <laughs> the alternative 
to what you want to say. Imagine if we had tone meters we could wear around our necks I love as it. we walked around the world. <laughs> Oof, be a really quiet right. world. Tone, I love tone, it. Tone. Right. Um, I think you and I are both so familiar with right. the apps, right. but people listening may not be. So my family wizard has, my family wizard. Wizard has mm-hmm. a tone meter. Yes. Can you talk a little bit about how that uh, yes. plays out on the app? Because I think it's a really great feature. Yes. So in family court, sometimes the court has to order that parties have to use an app to communicate communicate yes. with one another. Mm-hmm. And so what our family wizard does, if you send an email because you're supposed to communicate with your other party, your other parent on the app, it'll tell you, hey, check your tone when you send this email. And that's based on the words. That that's based putting. on the mm-hmm. words that you mm-hmm. put in the message mm-hmm. to the mm-hmm. other party. And mm-hmm. I also say with the mm-hmm. apps, keep it short. Please mm-hmm. don't mm-hmm. give of seven page letter. <laughs> but see, that's what narcissistic people right. do. Is they do give seven page letters. And you know, the features of you know mm-hmm. our family wizard mm-hmm. talking parents is that they create a a record, a record. where mm-hmm. a record that is actually admissible in court. In court. Yes. And that, that uh-huh. starts to unravel mm-hmm. the narcissistic mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. Mass as well. If the court continuously sees seven-page letters. In, That's exactly in the app. right. Mm-hmm. Does the do the courts mandate the use of the apps? Is it- the parties can either agree on their own, or if the communication is just so far out of control, the mm-hmm. court will mandate. Okay. Okay. Got yeah, it. The so use the court of the app. Mm-hmm. Okay. You know what's interesting about narcissistic folks and divorces? At some point, the kids sort of feel like mm-hmm. a nuisance to them and sort of put cramp in their style yep. and all of that. They could do the Disneyland parent mm-hmm. thing for a minute and show mm-hmm. up and be all that. But they're not really interested in the hard work of parenting in many no. of these cases. Most of the cases I've seen, once they have won whatever custody schedule they were seeking, it falls apart. Yeah, 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 yeah. Nine times out yeah. of ten. I think there are folks out there who think that Going in front of a judge will be this moment when someone is going to bear witness in this really public kind of judicially way Mm -hmm. that someone's going to bear witness that this person's a narcissist and there's going to be this magic moment. It'll be recognized. The judge is going to see it. It's going to unmask the narcissist in this really public way and that the person going through this will feel whole. What you got to say about that? That makes for great TV. <laughs> but unfortunately, yeah. that's yeah. not realistic. It's, yeah, yeah. And, and and do you ever have clients who think, think that they think that's going to happen? People want to be vindicated. Yes, they, they do. They, they want to be seen, Yeah, they want to be seen. But unfortunately, it's not in court. Yeah. I think it's a human desire that somebody, especially a person in a position of authority, will bear witness to your pain. Right. And I think that that, if people are not prepared that that's not going to happen, mm-hmm. it can actually feel like a catastrophic moment right. of even in this place where I thought that rightness mm-hmm. and justice was mm-hmm. going to be delivered, it wasn't seen. What is the rest of my life going to look like? Mm-hmm. When we have the sense that the world is an unjust place right. at such a big level, mm-hmm. it can actually be this really big existential hole right. that people fall into. But. I'm going to refer them back to our expectation conversation Yeah, yeah. of what mm-hmm. the court is, what their mm-hmm. role is, mm-hmm. and what we can expect from yeah, the experience. Yeah. So it's go- before the person goes in, mm-hmm. they need to be aware of that. And you're right. This isn't yes. a TV show right. where there's, there's this grand moment and everything is seen and the person or people are clapping at the end and it's you're crying and your yeah, attorney's no. hugging you. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, Sorry so, to bust the bubble. Yeah, yeah. No, it's good to bust bubbles because otherwise it's, it's it can get messy. Demetria, mm-hmm. can you tell people where to find you? I am everywhere. Definitely. Uh, yes, on you are. <laughs> social media. I'm Demetria Graves. I'm on Instagram, Facebook. You can email me at info at gravesloffirmca.com. Um, I have my own podcast, Legally Uncensored, where I talk about a lot of these issues as well. You're such a fresh, wonderful voice. Oh, I'm so glad that we, ha- I, again, selfishly, mm. so glad that everyone's like, oh, I need an attorney. Mm. I got someone for you. <laughs> I got the, I've got a referral. So I can't thank you for mm. taking time out of your very busy schedule. Really important work you do to share this with you. I've learned so much and I'm mm. so grateful to you. So thank you. Well, thank you. I'm very, very happy thank to you. be here. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Here are my takeaways from my conversation with Demetria. Let's break down Demetria's pre-divorce checklist for divorce from a narcissistic person, which is about the psychological shifts you will need to make within yourself. Her checklist highlights the issue of expectations and mental preparation. 
she reminds us that one, the gloves are off, and this is likely to be contentious and ugly. To the degree that it is possible, you need to psychologically prepare for this. Number two, it will be more expensive than non-narcissistic divorces. Issues such as over-litigation mean that cost overruns will happen. And that means it is essential you hire a good attorney who understands this strategically so they can be mindful of their time and your money. Number three, they may hire an antagonistic attorney themselves, and it can feel like you are fighting two people. Demetria reminds us that while this can be overwhelming and anxiety producing, it is your attorney's job to handle the arrogance and the nastiness of the opposing attorney. You just need to be ready for it. Number four, she also stresses that people must have realistic expectations about custody and co-parenting. Next in her checklist is the idea that you need to hire a solid attorney that understands narcissism. If you are met with pushback, like everyone thinks their ex is a narcissist during a divorce, well then your concerns may not be taken seriously enough. Find an attorney that hears your concerns without minimizing them. Because if they do not know what they are up against, the divorce may end up being more expensive and take longer. She also strongly encourages clients to work with an attorney that has experience navigating the narcissistic divorce landscape. She also warns against choosing an attorney that is too passive and assumes things will just work their way out. But above all else, she encourages trusting your intuition. In my next takeaway, the key mistakes that Demetria highlighted were that people overengage from the start, don't have a plan, and have the wrong attorney. This may be the fight of your life, so being strategic, tactical, and as supported as possible is essential, especially in a system that doesn't really care if your ex is a narcissist. In this next takeaway, as part of her pre, during, and post-divorce checklist, Demetria strongly encourages people going through a narcissistic divorce work with a therapist. A lawyer is not a therapist, and therapy is the place to work through the strong emotions that this process can bring up. Now this takeaway is important. Not everyone can afford to hire an attorney and Demetria provided information on some resources to consider exploring. If the narcissistic person has an attorney, you will need one as well. And working with local pro bono and legal aid organizations can give you some essential guidance as you go through this process. So in this next takeaway, when it comes to working through the custody process, Demetria had three key recommendations. The first was documentation. Documenting everything and presenting hard data is far more important than saying this is toxic or the other parent isn't following the plan. Second was the use of family communication apps that allow you to keep a running record of communication. Finally, she again highlighted the importance of therapy, not just for the parent, but also for children. And finally, for those of you not married yet, this episode may actually have more relevance than you realize. If you don't want to have to get out, then pay attention to how you come in. People are able to lavish attention on the minor details of wedding seating arrangements and honeymoon hotels, and that's fine. But the same level of attention and detail have to go into talking through and planning what you want a marriage to look like. We floated the idea of an informed consent form for marriage, and while that may not exist yet, there is no reason you can't explore these issues, uncomfortable though they may be, before 
you sign that marriage license.